Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ware Harmon, and I'm the Executive Director of Town Hall Seattle. On behalf of our team and our friends at Third Place Books, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's presentation with Michelle Miller-Fisher, Amber Winnick, and Zoe Greggs. As we get underway, I want to acknowledge that our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, and particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continuing use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. We are very, very glad to have you all with us today. This afternoon's program will run around 60 minutes-ish, including Q&A. You'll notice we're using a new Q&A system, this system in this hybrid season of in-person events and virtual events. Um, and this system is synthesizing things for us on those two fronts. So to submit your questions, uh, please enter meet.ps forward slash motherhood or scan the QR code right now on your screen with a smartphone. We'll drop the link in the chat as well and remind you later uh, how to manage this once we arrive at the Q&A proper. We can't guarantee we'll be able to address every question, but we'll try to get to as many as possible. And you can help us by keeping your own question concise. For those who would like to view the program with closed captions, please click the CC button in the bottom right corner of your video player. Town Hall's adding new events and podcasts every day. Upcoming programs include Barto Elmore on Monsanto's past and our food future. Um, uh, Michael Lennox and Rebecca Duff on decarbonizing the global economy, Jessica Pierce and Mark Beekoff will discuss what the lives of dogs would be like if they lived in a world without humans, uh, and a soon-to-be-announced evening with Neil Stevenson, I'm not quite sure what we picked that one to talk about today, but at any rate, and uh, a soon-to-be-announced evening with Neil Stevenson live from our building. Also, I want to make sure you've heard about our soon-to-launch podcast, Beasts of Seattle. From orcas and salmon to dogs and Bigfoot, host Samantha Allen will offer a deep dive into the creatures that lurk around our domestic reality and civic imagination. Uh, visit our website to join our email list and get the latest updates as more programs are added throughout the year. Uh, Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our many sponsors for events in science and culture. They include Microsoft and the Wincoat Foundation Northwest. But as you likely know, Town Hall is at heart a member-supported organization, and I want to thank all of our members joining us today. If you share in Town Hall's vision of a community energized and empowered by questions of po politics, science, and culture, please consider supporting us by becoming a member, too. Finally, I know you're going to want to dive deeper into today's topic by purchasing a copy of the author's highly visual book. The quickest way to do so is to visit the link in the chat below, which will take you directly to our friends at Third Place Books. And time is tight or you would hear me launch into a spiel about why it's important to buy local, but you already know that already. So with that, Michelle Miller Fisher is a curator and architecture and design historian. Uh, architecture and design historian, sorry for that. Previously a curator of European decorative arts and design at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. She is a Ronald C. and Anita L. Warnick curator of contemporary decorative arts at the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. She lectures frequently on design, people, and the politics of things. Uh, designing motherhood, as you will learn, is the product of six years collaborative work. And she's now at work on her next book, ten tentatively titled Craft Schools, Where We Make What We Inherit. Writer and design historian Amber Winnick is the recipient of two Fulbrights and has lived, researched, and written about family and child-related designs, policies, and practices around the world. In addition to her writing and consulting, she holds regular study groups around child development and respectful caregiving. Zoe Greggs is a queer, Black, disabled, Philadelphia-based artist and nonprofit administrator who serves as the Community Outreach Coordinator at Maternity Care Coalition. Greggs is also the curatorial assistant for Designing Motherhood, where she provides expertise in community engagement, project management, and art history. Fisher and Winnick's new book, Designing Motherhood, The Things That Make and Break Our Births, is the subject of today's discussion. Please join me in welcoming Zoe Greggs, Amber Winnick, and Michelle Miller Fisher. Thank you so very much, Ware, and thank you to everybody at Town Hall. We are so grateful to be here. Um, as you said, questions are super welcome, and so please let them come in at any point during our discussion. We'll speak for about 30, 35 minutes, I think, um, and then we'll open for a Q&A in earnest. But if you have burning questions, we're so happy to answer them throughout. Um, we just got wonderful introductions, so I don't know that we need to introduce our ourselves further, but it's going to be a conversation um, between all three of us, uh, Amber, myself and Zoe, um, on this project that is a book, but has also been a much larger multi multi multifaceted project um, that has really spanned many different elements, but also just a community of people and an entire culture which we've grown from the grassroots up. And we'll explain, explain a little bit about why we had to grow that culture from the grassroots up to do this project. 
Zoe, you have so kindly said that you'll handle the slides this evening. So if you want to let them roll, then we can have um, the first slide. So you'll see when um, the presentation starts that designing motherhood is a lot of different things. And so if you want to go to the next slide, it started, um, well, it is a book. It's an exhibition, it's actually two exhibitions. They're um, currently at the Mutter Museum in Philadelphia. Um, the Mutter will show you some images of it uh, shortly, but it's the museum that's attached to the American College of Physicians, a very old um, and learned uh, organization that has really set the tone for much of uh, the medical establishment in the US for over 200 years. Um, so one part of our exhibition is there, the other part is at the Center for Architecture and Design, also in Philadelphia. Um, it's a series of public programs, it's also a design curriculum. Um, we found when we were both learning in and teaching in design history classes and design studio classes that this question of design for the arc of human reproduction was fairly absent. And so we wanted to make sure that part of this project was going to address that. Um, it's a story banking project, which we'll talk a little bit about um, at the end of this as well. And that's led by Zoe and another colleague of ours, Gabriella Nelson. Um, but it really started off as an Instagram account. And so Zoe, if you want to go to the next slide, um, it began a long time ago. I think the first time Amber and I ever clocked eyes on each other was actually in my house. We were having a baby shower for a friend of ours and um, we uh, started to chat. Uh, Amber brought this amazing upside down cake and um, that was our first meeting with each other. Cute to maybe, I don't know Amber, we, it's, the timeline has become hazy because we've known each other for a long time now but probably a year and a half or so later we went out to dinner with the same friend actually and that's when we really started to chat. I was a curatorial assistant at MoMA at the time I was in the architecture and design department. Um, Amber was an independent design historian. Amber you'd had Alice by that point in time so you were the mum of one um, and we started talking about the designs that really made our hearts sing, made us really interested in the landscape that we were invested in. And they were designs that we had used a lot of the time, um, bodily embodied designs, menstrual cups, maternity wear, that type of thing. Um, they were things that we'd studied. Amber had written quite extensively on maternity wear as part of her uh, graduate work at the Bard Graduate Center. But there were also things that we really didn't see when we were going out to look at exhibitions, um, when we were uh, reading in either survey textbooks or, or specialist books about design. And so we decided then and there that it would be a good thing to form a partnership of some sort and we said I really wish there was a book around this so the story in many ways starts a lot like this picture here with us chatting and chatting and chatting about the things that we really care about in design um, but then if you go to the next slide Zoe um, the the first permutation of designing motherhood and really sort of the, the heart of it in many ways was an Instagram account we'll explain in a, in a moment why we went there um, but it really boiled down to the fact that we couldn't find any Instagram institutional support for this project um, right at its very beginning and to be honest in its middle as well it was only sort of close to the end that we started to, to, to have um, some of the amazing support that we've been lucky to have so we began an Instagram handle at the time it was just me and Amber um, who were the main audience and it was a way for us to be able to send design objects ideas issues and concerns and questions around this arc of human reproduction um, to one another I had a full-time job at um, a museum so I was often there very late into the wee hours Amber had an independent practice and also was raising a child and so um, we were often asynchronous but this was a way for us to tell each other what we'd been thinking about what we'd been learning and researching so the time we built um, a community. If you go to the next post, Zoe, um, the very first post uh, that we ever made was Lucille Ball. This came out of our shared love of maternity, maternity um, fashion much, much, much unloved in most museum collections, um, but just fascinating in terms of its design histories that cross over with so many parts of other cultural, visual, political, economic histories. Um, here, you wouldn't know it, but Lucille Ball is wearing a really beautiful, fantastic, skirt that we'll show you a pattern for um, momentarily. Um, but this was our lives. This was the way in which we made this project come to life for ourselves while we put together a book proposal. Um, and uh, when we had that book proposal, I still had my job at MoMA. And so I took it into my mentor and the wonderful director of publishing um, at MoMA, Paul Antonelli and Chris Hudson, who were fantastic. And they said to Amber and I, what a great idea. This is not something that MoMA is going to be able to do. But Chris very generously opened up his Rolodex of um, publishing contacts. And he said, send it out. I'm sure somebody will bite. 
And we were, we were really naive. We were so excited. We were like, of course, well, if Chris says someone will buy, great, I'm sure they will. And so we sent it out to um, big publishers, small publishers, academic publishers, totally confident that somebody else, at least at least one person, maybe we thought several people, were going to find this subject as interesting as we did. Um, and no one did. <laughs> uh, the responses that we got back were fascinating subject, but that kind of sort of awkward response somebody gives you when they want to brush you off. Um, people asked, who on earth is your audience for this? Or they said, it's too interdisciplinary. We're really not sure how to market a book like this. We, we've, we've no idea how an audience would connect with it. And so, we we didn't agree, obviously, um, but we said, you know what, if we can't make it happen through these institutional channels, then we'll just write it ourselves. We know we want it to be a book. We don't care who it's published by. We just want this knowledge out there in the world in this form. Uh, Q2 a couple years later, and I'd moved to Philadelphia to the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And if you go to the next slide, um, Zoe, which has your beautiful smiling face on it, along with Karen's, um, Amber and I had really exhausted all of the connections that we had in institutions. When I got to the PMA in, in Philly, I'd also proposed this as some kind of project. And I was told uh, unequivocally by the her director of the museum that it was not design um, and it was not decorative arts and therefore it was not my job. Um, and so we looked around and realized that it wouldn't be an arts institution perhaps that would be at the vanguard of thinking of this kind of um, topic of taking it on, thinking about design for the art of human reproduction. And then we got incredibly lucky. A wonderful friend of ours who is um, an architecture and design person in Philly, Erica DeVrea said, have you heard of Maternity Care Coalition? They're a really amazing organization based in Philadelphia focused on maternal and infant health. You should go down and speak with them because maybe they'd apply for a Pew grant with you. Pew is a funding body that's dedicated to work happening creatively in Philadelphia. And we said, well, what's the worst that we can happen? You know, let's go down. There were 10 minutes walk away from the Philadelphia Museum of Art. So I went down one day um, and uh, introduced myself to Karen and uh, Karen introduced me to Zoe and I said, my partner and I have this project and we would really like to be able to collaborate with someone who not only gets it, but is actually at the forefront of doing things about it. We could learn a lot from your organization. And maybe what we could do in return is tell people in this city and further abroad about the work that you've been doing for 40 years, um, which is not as well known as it maybe should be. And to our eternal gratitude, Karen said, I'm not really too sure it is what you're doing, but it sounds interesting. What do you need? And we said, a letter of interest by tomorrow <laughs> for the pew. And she said, okay, let's try it. Let's see, let's see what happens. And the rest has really been history. So with Karen and Zoe, um, Zoe was just amazing right from the beginning and had as an artist, the sensibility about this work um, from the get go. Uh, that was the beginning of the Designing Motherhood and Maternity Care Coalition collaboration. And so if you go to the next slide, um, it's really important for us to credit the many, many people across many different institutions who work on this project. Juliana Rowan Barton um, was someone who I work with at the Philadelphia Museum of Art on another project called Designs for Different Futures, and we called upon her amazing curatorial prowess. She became part of our team. Um, in the next slide, Gabriella Nelson is the Associate Director of Policy at Maternity Care Coalition. We were actually doing picture research for the book by the time that we met her. We wanted images of um, feeding of all different, of different types, and we were looking at the Maternity Care Coalition social media, and this amazing picture of Gabriella on the right came up, and like, who is this? <laughs> can we use their picture? Can we meet them? They're amazing. Turned out Gabriella is not just a policy director at, the, at MCC, she's a city planner. So she has design and architecture and these questions already absolutely in her DNA. So she turned out to be a really fantastic partner on the project too. And then Zoe, I wonder if maybe you want to introduce the folks in the next slide because this was your brainchild and, and really wonderful shepherding of these relationships. Yeah, I would love to. Thank you. Um, so here we have our MCC Advisory Council and essentially um, towards the beginning of the collaboration between DM and MCC, we were really thinking about how can we have the experts at the table who are doing this work at Maternity Care Coalition also act as a compass on this project, not just to lend um, their wisdoms of the programs, but also just the information and knowledge that they carry on an everyday basis that um, unfortunately, you know, when you're doing nonprofit work or care work in general is just not appreciated or compensated as it should be. 
baby. Um, so we were very, very lucky to have four fantastic uh, folks who we have now titled our advisors. We have Adrian Edwards, Sabrina Taylor, Takara Ganey, and Portia Holland. This is a council of lactation experts, doulas, educators, uh, children's book author, <laughs> um, even, um, and they are just each one of them a powerhouse in of itself. And we are so lucky to have them on this project. They really led the way to expansive conversations. Um, and I don't think we could have guessed at the beginning with creation of the council that it would end up being such a really lovely, deep, caring relationship between all of us. It's really great. And I think building on exactly what you said there, Zoe, maybe if we go to the next slide, the book was important to us, but what has become paramount as part of this project is creating a culture that we work within. Um, so you mentioned what it is to work in a nonprofit. And I think if anybody's worked in that kind of scenario, um, you know that it is often, or as an independent person, you know too, um, uh, if you've worked as Amber does, you know that often you're asked to do a lot with a very little. There's a culture of burnout, of really pushing people towards their very edges. And when we were talking about and writing about and researching care work, we wanted to think about all of that naughtiness and to find ways in which to work around that subject and within that subject, but also with each other in ways that were perhaps more caring and sustainable and just more equitable um, than they might usually be, which, which didn't happen perfectly. There's, there's no model that has worked out perfectly on um, in this project, but it has been, I think, the thing that we cherish the most about it. So these are just uh, this slide and the next one tells a little bit of the story of what Maternity Care Coalition is and does. Part of this project enabled us, um, spearheaded again by Zoe, um, to go through the archives of Maternity Care Coalition who've been in Philly for the last 40 years. They've been doing work that helps um, support maternal and infant health outcomes, um, which are often disproportionately uh, uh, negative or impacted uh, based on many intersections, but certainly based on the intersection of race and the intersection of economic status. Um, and so here you see one of the signature programs of Maternity Care Coalition in the top right, um, their mom mobile in the 1980s, and then in the bottom right, the mom mobile um, a bit uh, uh, closer to the present day. Um, and then folks out um, on the streets of Philadelphia telling people about the services that folks can avail themselves of um, if they need them, uh, birth advocates, doula support, postpartum support, many different types of interlocking services that really put the client at the heart of um, uh, the the conversation rather than being a service provider model that really focuses on the, the organization providing the services. So in the next slide, you see folks going um, door to door um, and, and really being part of the fabric of the community. And we argued that this was um, design, a form of city planning, a form of making a city a healthy place to be um, by focusing these resources on people who needed them the most. And so in the next slide, this is the range of amazing collaborators that we now work with. And I want to underscore, this is something that everyone is doing um, in their evenings and weekends really this is not something that any of the institutions for whom we worked really had time or space for or wanted to support um, and so we have been incredibly lucky to have funders like the Pew and the Graham Foundation, to have exhibition partners like the Mutter and the Center for Architecture, um, UPenn as our curriculum partner, and then these amazing companies who do a lot of um, brilliant things through design for people who uh, are somewhere on that spectrum of the arc of human reproduction every single day. So the book, though, is something that we are uh, so happy about and cherish so much. And maybe, Amber, do you want to talk a little bit about how we came to the design and what people can find out when they pick it up? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we are so lucky. We've not only had, um, you know, incredible people that we've met along the way, um, but we also gathered uh, and had a great adventure with the designers Clonada. Um, and that is um, Lana based in Croatia and um, another designer based in Brooklyn, um, Natasha, and they have been absolutely incredible and designed for us this beautiful book, um, which is really interspersed um, with all kinds of, it's a quite visual book as we're mentioned at the start. Um, it's essays and the 
visuals are both family phot photographs, um, including Gabriella's that we talked about, my daughter Alice on her first hours is represented here, but then there we really called from a great source of um, art history and um, contemporary photographers and um, photographs and images that were around in the culture. Um, and we're really, really so proud of the outcome. Um, so you'll find these kind of miniature visual chapters within the larger written ones. Maybe if you want to go to the next slide or two, as well as Zoe Amber, you can talk maybe about the, the what, what folks see just here. Yeah, sure. So, um, so we have, as Michelle mentioned, um, the Maternity Care Coalition um, opened their archives to us and that was such an incredible experience. Um, and we really were so lucky to find so many rich images from the 80s and beyond um, at the beginning of Ma Maternity Care Coalition's life. And um, what you'll see on the right is one of those images in, in, in um, this visual essay. And to the left, we have a series of paintings by the artist Helen Redman, um, who should be a household name, but really hasn't been um, in her depiction of pregnant people and their babies. So we managed to go from having many, many no's for this project. Um, so many no's, like we still have way, I think if we were to have a counter rate, Amber and Zoe, we would have a much longer list of the no's or the very polite, how fascinating, um, which was another genre of responses in and of itself. Um, but we started this year to get some yeses, which really was lovely after many years of putting this project together, um, many years of trying to negotiate um, working with over 50 really fantastic um, collaborators and contributors in the book alone, um, putting together two exhibitions with two fantastic curatorial teams. There are so, so, so many other people than the three of us that you see on screen. Um, and one of the sort of peak moments was seeing the menstrual cup um, in the pages, uh, both the print and digital pages of the New York Times magazine, of seeing our project in The Guardian, which I grew up reading at home in the UK, of getting into Vogue. Um, we even had a small cameo on Goop's podcast the other day, which <laughs> we were totally blown away by. Um, we were unused to some of these very positive responses after having um, many people dismiss or deride either the subject area, um, the idea of it being visually appealing enough to be a, a, a topic um, for an exhibition or for there being an audience for the book. Um, the book is sold really well. It's hard to get a copy of right now. Um, and that's only a couple of weeks after it coming out into the world. And I think it's testament to the fact that this really is um, a topic which we always argue touches everybody at least once in their lives because everybody alive today has been born. So reproductive um, designs uh, really matter to, to everyone. Um, and uh, also matter in terms of the choice and agency along a reproductive justice arc of how one chooses to use um, um, or to access or to be denied access to or to have difficulty around uh, conversations around that arc of reproduction into the future. Um, so if you go maybe to the next couple of slides, Zoe, um, if you are in Philadelphia at any point over the coming months, um, you'll be able to see the exhibition that's currently at the Mutter Museum. This is a little bit of what it looks like. Um, we uh, ended up having a really interesting discussion with our curatorial team um, who are wonderful, uh, Dr. Anna Dodi, Dr. Robert Hicks, Nancy um, Hill, uh, their amazing designer, Michael Keyes. Um, the other outside designer here is Helen Kong. Um, the Mutter, if you've been to it, you know, if you haven't, um, we can give you the, the one minute overview. It is the museum attached to the American College of Physicians. It is peopled and populated by hundreds of years of medical science, um, incredible histories there. When you walk upstairs at the Mutter Museum, which is something that struck us almost immediately, there's portraits of all of the fellows, all of the great and good of the medical establishment who have had some hand in shaping um, what has been handed down as medical knowledge, as medical institutions, as medical systems in this country in particular. Um, you can see out of the 50 or so portraits that they have on display, and there are many more in storage, uh, two women. Everybody else is a, 
a man and a white man. And so for us, it really sort of brought home the, um, the, the difference in an exhibition like this, where we center midwifery models, for example, or birth advocacy models, uh, where we center the experiences um, of people who have uh, undergone medical racism, uh, where we have that as a glossary entry as part of the wall labels. These are conversations that I think the curators at the museum were very desperate to have. And this was a vehicle where why we could collaborate with them in order to bring some of those things to the surface. Um, so, so if you flick through just a couple of the um, uh, slides just here um, and on and on, then I think um, this gives you a little understanding of what it looks like at the Mutter. And then at the Center for Architecture, um, in the next couple of slides, this is the sister exhibition. Uh, this is on for a sh slightly shorter period of time. It was meant to be concurrent, but it's actually worked out really nicely because of the pandemic. Um, we have these two spaces to, to bring together communities of, of medical knowledge, um, design knowledge, and the Center for Architecture and Design is also right in the heart of Philadelphia, tons of foot traffic going past it. And so we have these big posters at the front that asks the um, sort of critical question of, have you thought about um, design for the arc of human reproduction? Um, uh, recently come on in and take a look um, at some of the designs that shape the world. Um, here, one of them being actually the really fantastic history of the um, design of the maternity ward in US hospitals, a place that um, at the very beginning of the 20th century, not many people saw. Um, it was around 1% of people were giving birth in a hospital environment, queue to the end of that century, and 1% uh, of people were giving birth at home. The rest of everybody was in the hospital environment. So these designs of spaces, not just the objects within them, have profoundly changed the ways in which we all come into the world. Um, I'm just looking at what we have in our next slides just here. So if you want to go on just another two there, Zoe, um, part of the, um, part of the pro project at the Center for Architecture, um, which uh, also fed into uh, the ways in which we brought artists' voices into the book was commissioning three living artists um, to respond to the subject of um, designing motherhood. And so Michelle Angela Ortiz, Helena Metaferia, and here in the foreground, the amazing Boston-based wood artist, Alison Kearney Moses, um, all worked with the um, MCC advisors who were there from the very beginning of the process, um, interviewed all of the possible artists, chose them, and then worked with them through the commissions um, to think about the ways in which their work at MCC, their incredibly hard direct service work, um, was going to be manifested and honored in the space of the exhibition itself. Um, so we'll get to a few uh, questions, I think, in the next um, five minutes or so, but we wanted to note just some of the designs to kind of give you a flavor of the conversations that you'll find in the book. And so maybe as we're going through, I don't know, Amber and Zoe, if you want to shout out and choose the one that you want to talk about, um, I'm happy to start with this one just here. Um, we have a chat. Looks like Michelle froze there. Oh. Oh, 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 sorry. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Cool. Okay. I'll, I'll be quick on this one. Sorry, my internet connection went unstable there for a second. Um, not many people know I was saying that um, the home pregnancy test came from a graphic designer, not a scientist, not somebody in a lab, um, but somebody who was trained in design. Um, Meg Crane. Uh, was a young packaging designer at Organon, a pharmaceutical company. She was based in its New Jersey offices and she was walking through the labs one day with a friend. The labs were attached to her uh, design studio offices and she looked at a row of test tubes and she said, what's going on here? And she was told that they were So Michelle, you were saying that this is um, uh, well, my comes back. Okay, so shall we progress slides? Great. Um, 
So this is the Dalcon Shield, um, which is an IUD. Um, so we feel free to jump in as well. Uh, we, um, we interviewed the really wonderful uh, reproductive justice advocate, Loretta Ross in the book, um, who drew attention to the Dalcon Shield um, when it caused um, the design flaw of the Dalcon Shield was that the wick uh, invited bacteria to climb up it. And it resulted in the unfortunate instance of her and many, many others um, having uh, public inflammatory disease and also um, having to have their uterus removed. In the case of Loretta Ross, it was done without her permission. And she's become a very important advocate for um, reproductive agency as a result of this. So we tell her story within the book. Yeah, and I think one of the um, lovely things about being able to work with the Mutter, they have this incredible historical collection of objects, uh, one of which is an example of the Dalcon shield. And so we've been able to bring these um, collection objects out, put them on display, but then connect them with works that are from the 21st century. And so if we go to the next slide, um, there's uh, some and it's actually been sadly timely again. Um, what's very known in various ways, either as the Dell M kit, the menstrual extraction kit, or the at-home abortion kit. Um, and it's made using um, different elements that you can find very easily, either you know now over Amazon, then in a grocery store, or actually in a, um, a pet supply store, an aquatics supply store. Um, but it was created by uh, self-help clinics where um, folks would band together in order to provide uh, access to abortion uh, when it was pre uh, Roe v. Wade in the US. And so there's a fantastic um, uh, history, for example, in book form, actually, which we really recommend of the underground abortion uh, service, Jane in Chicago. Um, this particular model came out of the self-help clinic in um, California, uh, in, uh, uh, near Los Angeles. Um, and it really works on sort of a suction pump. It's, a, it's an aspiration kit um, that was not new technology by any means at the time, but was not designed in this particular way to make it um, available and accessible to uh, a greater number of, pe number of people who are working out of each other's homes. Um, and then in the next couple of slides, we have the seminal Our Bodies, Ourselves. Um, we've been really interested uh, in looking at designs that come from communities um, that are for them, of them, and by them. Our Bodies, Ourselves, of course, was a, 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 a sort of actually as a course in Boston in 1969 um, and came together as a Xerox sheet of, um, or sheaf, I should say, of uh, stories and recommendations and um, knowledge about one's body and body literacy and body agency that was circulated um, for very cheap um, and then built upon in successive editions. I think it's become one of the most widely translated uh, books across the world. Um, it came out of a group of women not being able to put together a list of doctors that they actually trusted to ask their questions and to treat them with respect. Um, it really uh, has many stories that are founded on direct experiences of people who have gone through um, birth, who have gone through sexual trauma, who have gone through many different um, uh, uh, instances that were not necessarily taken seriously or were not given at uh, the correct agency within medical establishments. Of course, it was written by 12 very white, very middle-class women, and so successive editions of Our Bodies, Ourselves have addressed the need for increasing inclusivity um, across multiple intersections. Um, so the very uh, last book that is associated with that series, although written independently, is Trans Bodies, Trans Selves, which came out in 2014. Um, Zoe or Amber, does someone want to talk about the next slide, um, which sort of is peppered all over the book and also all over the exhibitions in terms of its themes? Uh, Amber, would you mind? It's definitely yes. yours. <laughs> Absolutely. No, it's um, it's a topic near and dear to my heart, um, just because I'm within it myself. Um, and that's the fourth trimester or the postpartum period, um, which really goes beyond the fourth trimester or the first 40 days here. Um, we say that once you're postpartum, you're always postpartum. Um, but um, yeah, we look at a range of cultural 
uh, responses to this period, including um, the Kramsorg, which you see on the left, that's the wonderful Dutch system um, in which everybody is provided with an at-home Kramsorg or a nurse to answer any questions and help and support in those critical days and weeks and really months um, after a birth. And um, we look at food ways, um, Chinese food ways and other ways. We look at um, uh, binding methods, which um, are very nurturing to uh, postpartum bodies and really just look at these practices, um, always starting with an object or a design intervention to help empower or um, you know, typify some sort of cultural response to this period. And we also have a chapter written on um, by one of the amazing uh, design directors of the Make the Breast Pump Not Suck Hackathon out of the MIT Media Lab on the lack of postpartum um, paid leave in places like the US and countries. Yeah, that's very important. important. Thinking about the, the way in which systems uh, lack as much as the systems that do work. Um, we'll talk about this slide and then we'll move into questions because there's some really good ones coming into the chat and so we can all divide and conquer on those. And maybe if we have three minutes or so at the end, we can queue up the amazing story banking project which Zoe and Gabriella have directed, which is a really nice coda and a way to sum up the project. But here you're looking at um, a design that more people than one might think actually need or use. So if you've never seen a pessary, um, here you go, but it's probably quite likely that you have given that one in every two people with a uterus will have some kind of pelvic prolapse during their life. Um, we ended up meeting the folks behind Rhea, which is a new pessary company. Um, when they came to a talk that we did actually, it wasn't necessarily something that was on our radar because we haven't had a pelvic prolapse yet. Um, but uh, we actually, when we started to think about this as a topic, realized that family members or others that we knew had, and it had been a fairly taboo topic. Um, Rhea ha is a company headed by three women, I think all of them still in their twenties or maybe very early thirties now that met each other in an engineering class in Cornell. Uh, they were given the brief to find a patent that they should um, engage with one that maybe um, uh, could help them think about engineering something new and they settled upon the um, patent at least in the US for the uh, pessary which hadn't really been meaningfully updated since 1938. Um, they looked at the past histories of the pessary. And again, this is where the Mutter's collection really came into its own. You can see on the bottom left, just here, um, the vitrine where we went through. And this isn't even like a third of the different types of pessaries that they have within the museum. Um, but pessaries came in all shapes and sizes. The very earliest of them were balls of wool or an orange or a pomegranate. Um, you then get these contraptions made out of different pieces of metal and wood, none of which I would put anywhere near my vagina. Um, and so uh, they decided that they would make something out of flexible silicone, something that could be inserted and removed by the person uh, needing to use it rather than a provider, as is so often the case. Um, something that really functions very much just like a tampon, but hadn't been given any attention, so hadn't um, uh, come into to, to being like this. It's currently in FDA trial testing. If anyone's ever tried to put a medical design product out into the world, you know how long, long, long it takes for somebody to get to that particular stage. So it's massive kudos to this team that they've seen it through from an initial project um, uh, all the way through to, to it coming out into the world. And so this is part of um, the, the exhibition too. We have, um, I think, about 10 or, or 12 minutes that we could have for questions. And so we'll, we'll dive into some of them that we have been given just here. Um, and then maybe I'll get the um, video queued up so because we, we should definitely take a look at your amazing story banking, but we'll go right from the top. The first question and it's a great one. I think we can all talk about this in, in multiple ways, um, but maybe Zoe, like, do you want to answer this one first? How has your project been more inviting with gender? Having creating this work in this day and age, what challenges, if any, have been arising with gender fluidity and reproduction? Yeah, I think this is a really great question and something that we've had a lot of really com long conversations about. Um, personally, I want to, you know, say first that I am cis-identifying, so I cannot speak on behalf of trans people um, in this realm. But we've had a lot of conversations about how, a, you know, motherhood, the terminology as it stands is quite a... a a loaded word, you know, um, and a lot of the times we are attributing motherhood to um, 
not just cishood, but also the ability to physically reproduce and physically birth. Um, you know, a really interesting part of this conversation is for the book, Michelle and Amber interviewed Thomas Beatty. Um, and he does not identify as a mother, he's a father, uh, but he does share his story of his birth experience in the book and how hard it was navigating the uh, medical industrial complex, trying to get his name um, and, you know, saying that he is a father on the birth certificate and how traumatic that was. So I definitely wouldn't say that every part of the project is perfect when it comes to talking about um, non-binary gender gender non-conforming folks i will say that you know at maternity care coalition in particular that is something that we are really trying to push for internally and externally is to shift our language around birth and moving away um, from focusing so much on the physical aspects and you know the lies that our system has created around what gender and sex is and focusing more on birthing people. Um, is there anything that Amber, Michelle, that you would like to add that I may have missed? I think that was perfect. Amber, I was gonna read the, I just pulled up the glossary that we have in our label content in both the exhibitions. I was gonna read that definition that we all worked on together. We talk about motherhood, which is a really difficult term for us. It was one that we really wrestled with in the title for this book. We define it as shorthand for acts that go beyond a gender binary and beyond people who have been pregnant or given birth. It is a descriptor that can be embodied, deferred, refused, taken on as a duty or expectation or otherwise engaged with in all its knotty contours. Motherhood is myriad. And I think we really stick by that. I think you're totally correct. So it's hard to um, think of our project as perfect in any way and certainly not in its discussions around um, gender. I think there's, as Thomas says, this language is in many ways still being um, evolved. It's, it's still coming into being because I think we've uh, existed with uh, many, or at least it's coming into being in the mainstream world because we have existed within such a tightly circumscribed system linguistically and experientially for so long. Um, but it's definitely been part of the conversation that we've tried to have with the project. The next question that we have, um, what is something that you haven't found else, anywhere else that you needed to include in your book? Which is an interesting one. I feel like I, maybe the first response I would have is almost everything in our book has been there for a really long time in plain view, but nobody has actually looked at it carefully enough in, um, in, in some of the sort of halls of culture that we have worked or that we frequent. And so, um, we also are very careful always to say that any of the work that we're doing, we are standing on the shoulders of many other people. So it's hard to think of something that isn't anywhere else that we included and somehow discovered or made space for. Um, I'm trying to think of... Yeah, uh, Michelle, if I can jump in too, um, you know, I, what you're saying is ringing so true to me that these objects or designs um, in all of their forms have existed for so long. But yeah, really delving in and looking at them in this way it has been so powerful. Um, and I'm thinking specifically about our Designs for Grief chapter. Yeah. You know, Designs for Grief, we really looked at um, uh, you know, the process of uh, having a stillborn child or losing a baby through miscarriage. These are um, episodes in life that the, we all sort of are tempted to look away from. And so this was a really uh, incredible opportunity to really focus on them and to look at the designs that are actually made um, for people who undergo this very difficult situation. And, um, you know, there's huge historical precedent for it from um, daguerreotypes depicting uh, mothers and their stillborn children um, in the 19th century onto uh, special cots that enable mothers to sit and be with their stillborn child after having given birth. Um, and really looking at them the ways that you know they've provided extra compassion for this difficult situation but also like maybe areas where they could be even better even improved upon um so you know i mean there are there are policies out there that um 
can be very punishing to mothers of, uh, or birthing people rather, of um, stillborn and miscarrying ch children. So yeah, we really, we really, it was difficult, but we really did try to focus in on these aspects that, you know, might not be in common conversational topics. Yeah. I guess, so the next question is a really great one too, and it sort of follows on. What has been the most surprising thing that you've encountered through this journey? I, I can think of something, but I'm happy to feed the floor if you, if you both want to go first, or I'm happy to get up, tell me. I just think the most surprising thing to me, and I've like I've worked for many museums at this point in time. I've worked for MoMA, I've worked for the Philadelphia Museum of Art, I've worked for the MFA in Boston now, I've worked for the MAT, I've worked for Guggenheim. We sent this proposal out to many places, including those places. And um, the most surprising thing to me, which is sort of unsurprising as well, given that the um, deal makers and decision makers really haven't had to use many of these designs ever. But the most surprising thing to me is how often people have said, we're just not interested or who's the audience here. I don't see this as being a successful project. We, um, I've, we've had more press with this project than we've had for anything else that we've ever done. Um, the book is now hard to get a copy of two or three weeks after it's come out because it's sold out its first run. Um, it really is surprising to me that we still have this massive resistance. Um, but as I said, unsurprising. Uh, we've had so many people say how excited they are about this project, not because it's anything radical, really, but just because it reflects some element of their own everyday lived experience, things that they've thought about for a long time, they've written about maybe that they've talked about that has somehow shaped their worlds, um, that people have talked about long before this particular project, too. Um, so I think that's been the most surprising thing for me, that there is still just you know, especially in an era where people are trying to get bodies in the doors of museums and we're still being told, even when we are selling some of the dead white men who are on display, that this is not something that is um, either palatable or profitable for these spaces. How about you, Zerio Amber? Anything more surprising? Yeah, I, I would say that um, I've developed a much deeper relationship with myself through the project. And I'd say it also really expanded for me and made me dive into a lot of the narratives that we've been fed um, and really grappling with them. Um, you know, when I was a teenager and in the closet, I was like, I'm gonna marry a man and I'm gonna have kids. And that is like what I'm gonna do. Um, and I think that fell to the wayside many years before designing motherhood. But I think through this project, um, it's also expanded for me what motherhood can be and what nurturing looks like and what care work can look like. Um, and it helped define for me that, you know, I do not think that I want to have children, but I, there are other ways that I can care for people, that I can mother, that I can birth, um, that aren't so um, binary and within like colonial, like white <laughs> uh, capitalist parameters. And I think that has been really refreshing. It's opened a door um, that I think for years to come, I'll still be sort of interrogating different things and trying to figure out more about myself. I love that answer, Zoe. Um, yeah, it's so beautiful. Yeah, really fantastic. I think we have maybe another couple of minutes. So I'll ask one other question, then I'll get the, the teaser up and maybe you can introduce it, Zoe. The next question we have in this study, what is the biggest myth within reproduction? Hmm. I, well, I would, go ahead go ahead you go ahead first, first. no no I'm curious about uh, what you would say that it's women's work yes it's not and so I think that's the part like right at the beginning of all the way through I think we've had this project siloed or pigeonholed as something that is for women whatever part of it that we're talking about and there's like there's 80 different chapters so there's a range of different experiences in this book um and through the exhibition but um Yes, I think that goes back to the very first question about gender and just stereotyping the type of, um, uh, uh, the way that we approach the topic of reproduction. But what would you say, Amber? Um, well, you know, I mean, not all designs necessarily <laughs> are 
good or necessary. And I think this project has really like opened my eyes to just how true that is. And as a design historian, it's kind of like difficult to, um, you know, walk that path in terms of, you know, so I, uh, I'm thinking about things like, you know, the crib or the baby monitor, objects that we are told that are so inevitable and so necessary in American culture. I say boo to that. I mean, I just really refute it because, um, you know, it was the objects themselves that made the need for them. And it's been so interesting to parent with that in mind. Um, you know, and just really be freed from those societal or cultural expectations that really come from the designs themselves. So interesting. Well said. Um, I have the link for the teaser and I'm going to send it in the um, chat to everyone actually. Um, or is it everyone, everyone? Maybe I'll just send it. Um, but can I send it to you? Because I think you have a better internet connection than I do. And would you be able, you'd be willing to play it? Cool. So we have our teaser coming up. Um, so maybe do you want to introduce a little bit about what story banking is as part of the Designing Motherhood project that then sets up what people are going to see? Yeah, I would be happy to. Um, so we have titled uh, the Story Banking Project for the babies. And essentially what it is, is it is a six part series. Um, you can watch it all together as a film. They're quite short. Each part is about five to six minutes. And they focus on um, a myriad of different topics that heavily impact birth givers, um, parents and families, not just um, in the Philadelphia region, but beyond. In this particular case, we are mainly focusing on Philadelphia and the work that Maternity Care Coalition does we're interviewing um, our advocates, our home visitors, our doulas, um, and they're really lending us their, their personal stories and reflections. And together it really weaves this beautiful collection of um, interviews where through these conversations, we also talk about different uh, design objects. What objects do they use maybe on a daily basis that they're not necessarily thinking about that are really core to their work. It can be anything from one of our um, interview guests, her object was a birthing ball. That was something that she used a lot because she was a doula, is a doula. Um, and just hearing the the heartfelt stories behind everything is, is really quite, quite beautiful. I don't think there's anything I missed. <laughs> Perfect. So we have three minutes, which is maybe how we'll end. Um, and thank you, everybody, for your amazing questions. The images that you'll see throughout this three minute um, uh, first episode of Zoe and Gabriella's story banking project, uh, most of them, almost 95% of them, I would say, come from MCC's archives. So watching the film, you get to see um, a little bit of uh, MCC's history. So over to you, Amber, if it's working for you and if it's not. Yeah, I am having a little bit of trouble getting it up here. Um, Zoe, I wonder, I just direct message to you. I wonder if it's possible for you to do it. And I will give it a go to and see if one of us can get it up. And if not, then we can very definitely share it with Town Hall. I've got it here actually, and it might work. Oh, great. Um, I have mine up as well. So whichever one okay. feels best, do you want me to take it? This is why we work as a team. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Okay. Sounds good. Give me one second. And I think you just have to hit that wee box of sharing sound when you do it. Yes. So you change. All that you change changes you. The only lasting truth is change. 15 years I worked in West Philly. I grew up in West Philly. So my girlfriend calls me the mayor of West Philly. She's like, is there any place in West Philly that we can go that nobody don't know you? And I'm like, number one, they probably knew me from when I grew up because you know, then we went to school up until eighth grade. So you still had those friends. And then for me being out in these streets, people know. When people see me, they're like, you work for the Mama Bill. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> MCC started as an advocacy organization. 
and there was a group of individuals in the Philadelphia area who were concerned about, in particular, infant mortality in some of the neighborhoods of Philadelphia that were comparable to infant mortality rates in developing countries. After a few years, the organization decided to get into the business of providing direct services, and that was in the late 80s. That's when the Mobile program was born, and the idea was really around going into the communities, doing a lot of door-to-door -door canvassing, finding places where pregnant people were, and then engaging them in services, because the perspective was that some of the infant mortality data was the result of lack of access to care. I had no intention on working in maternal child health. At the time, I was in grad school getting my master's for city planning, and a lot of my studies was focused on how cities are built, how to fund cities, a lot of looking at the numbers, not necessarily looking at people. So my city planning background allows me to look at systems within communities. So we're thinking public transportation, public education, food systems, and that city planning background helps me to then apply that to maternal child health. So thinking of policies outside the realm of public health that are normally very focused on maternal child health and thinking about the policies within our communities, within our cities, within our households that affect the way we're able to birth and parent. So it's hard to explain that because people want to put you in a box around a service delivery model. And what we do instead is center the needs of the client. So it's not about us as a provider and what we do, it's about centering the family and thinking about what they need. I want to be out here with people. I don't want to count people as numbers. They are people, they are human beings, they need things. I just literally broke down and cried because I didn't realize oof, how much impact I had on this young lady. So I think that's what keeps me going with this job and everybody say, how do you do 26 years? Um, it's because of things like that, because I know there's still young ladies out here, number one, that are being abused. Um, number two, that still don't know how to talk to their parents. Understanding that things are created by design, it's not a coincidence that certain people are dying through maternal mortality. It's not a coincidence that certain people are filling up the prisons. It's not a coincidence that certain people don't have access to good public education. These things were made by design. Somebody had an idea, somebody had a dream, and they designed it. So using that type of thinking to understand the systems that we currently live in, but understanding that somebody else can have a dream or an idea that is better, that liberates people, that can then be applied, helps me to do my work as well. I feel like every new baby that's born is an opportunity. It's like a new beginning every time and an opportunity to change the world through the experience that that individual child has. And that has been true from the beginning. And that is the project um, with so many hands behind it. Also in And we're so and pleased. I was just, sorry, sorry. Um, but my internet went out again. I apologize. I was just saying that that is that is the project with so many hands behind it and a book if you are so interested. And you're going to say we are so pleased to be able to present this evening. Yes, and we are ending right on time as usual. Perfect, perfect timing. So thank you all, Town Hall, for having us. And it's um, wonderful to have this support and such excellent questions. Thank you. Thank you. Zoe, Amber, Michelle, thank you so much for being with us, with us today. I know you're all calling from different places, and I'm sure our audience is all over the place as well, but this was a very beautiful presentation that you guys presented for us, so thank you for that. Thank you for having us. It was so kind of you all to come. Thank you for the brilliant questions.
Yes, of course. And for all of our audience at home, make sure to pick up a copy of the book from our partner bookseller, Third Place, and that link could be found in the chat. Uh, thank you all so much, and thank you for at home for watching. Have a great day.